How many of you know the strength is not in the length when it comes to preaching? <laughs> and you don't have to preach over an hour to get some real power, you know what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm talking to myself, really. I'm telling you, but I'm talking to myself. The title that I have for this message happens to be Conviction to Comfort. Conviction to Comfort, as in from conviction to comfort. And uh, we're going to start with Acts chapter 26. And that's where, I don't know if I would say that's the main text. Maybe it is the main text. I guess I should know I'm the preacher tonight. But that's where we're going to start for sure. Acts 26 verse 13, and we'll just read a few verses from verse 13 all the way to 19. And this is the Apostle Paul. I'm sure most of you are very familiar with this story and how it goes. But the Apostle Paul says, At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining around, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. And I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus who you persecute. But rise and stand on your feet, for I appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear to you, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles into whom now I send you, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God and that they might receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And I like this last verse. Not a whole lot of people really focus on that next verse. Verse 19 says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Lord, we just thank you that your presence is already here, Lord God. I know that you have received our worship, and I just ask, God, that you would just help me tonight, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that my confession right now is I, I feel really weak, Lord. And I know, Lord, that when we're weak, it's an opportunity for us to be out of the way so you can come in with some strength, Lord God. And you can minister through me tonight, and I just pray that you would do that, Father. I pray that you'd open up the ears in the hearts of everyone that's here, Lord, if there's something in this message that could speak to every one of them, Lord God, that would be great. And I just ask, God, that you would do it in your holy, precious name, Jesus. Amen and amen. amen. And so this is uh, what I've always found. I say always for, for most of my Christian life, which is just about my whole life. Um, I mean, I did have to make that decision one day, but I was raised in the church. You understand? So. Um, this is one of my favorite stories, and, and I, in this story, I uh, never, for a long time, I didn't understand what it was when he was talking about kicking against the pricks. And so years ago, I was a, a youth minister. I worked with the youth, with uh, another youth pastor as a youth worker, and then uh, eventually was given the privilege to become a youth pastor. And uh, somewhere in the mix, I prepared a message, and I was... I felt like the Lord wanted me to talk to the youth about conviction, and, and I studied it out, and I was like, okay, so some versions call it a goad, some say, you know, it's hard for you, Paul, to kick against a goad, and then he says, in another version, he says, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks, and so as I dug into it, I came to understand that, number one, it was a Jewish expression to kick against the pricks, but it did refer to something specific, so cattle and horses and and uh, whatever kind of livestock, when they were herding them, there would be a sharp, long pole that was pointed at the end. And they would actually use it to prod them and to prick at them, to get them to move in a different direction, to get them to move in the right direction. And so if you've never studied that out or never heard a message preached about it or anybody talk about it, well, that's what it means when he talks about a goad, if your Bible says goad, or if he says kick against the pricks. That's exactly what he's talking about. And what's really interesting is Acts 2.37 also uses that same reference, talks about 
how a group of people were pricked in their hearts. It was a group of people that Peter was preaching to. And they were pricked at the heart and it had a very positive effect. With Paul, it had a negative effect. He was kicking against those pricks. He was kicking against the, the prodding that was going on. But with this group that Peter preached to, it had a positive effect because right after that, they turned to Peter and the other apostles and said, what do we need to do? Like, what do we need to do to be saved? What do we have to do to get right? And so it's a reference to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. This message has been brewing in my heart for a really, really long time. And so uh, when I spoke the other night for my dad's uh, memorial, it just had to come out somehow. It had to ooze out in the message somehow, some way. And I noticed that there were people that were here that it was blatantly obvious how convicted they were. As Matt was talking, I noticed, and even when I was talking, they were sitting like right before me in the front, and it was amazing. It was like, oh my, wow. I mean, I'm talking mumbling under the breath, head in the hands, pull, practically wanting to pull their hair out. And I knew without a doubt that it was the conviction of the Holy Spirit because that's what, that's what the Holy Spirit does and that's one of the uh, effects that it may have on people and how they respond to it. There's other uh, places in the Bible where it refers to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. There's actually a lot of places, but there's two distinct that really stand out in my mind. And one of them is in Job, and he actually talks about the arrows of God, but he talks about it being like poison on the inside. And then David talks about the arrows of the Lord and how when they stick, they stick fast. In other words, the arrows are barbed. You know, you can't just come to an arrow that just came into your chest, your arm, your leg or whatever, and just rip it out like it's nothing. It's barbed. It goes in. It has an easy entry, not so easy to take out. And so I want to turn to Job chapter 33 along the lines of what we're talking about right this moment. <coughs> Job 33 and starting in verse 14, we'll go 14 to 16 and then we'll jump down to 27. So we'll go 14 to 16 and then we'll jump to 27. I'm just trying to save time because the strength's not in the length, right? I already said that. Uh, for God speaks once, yes, twice, yet man perceives it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men in slumberings upon the bed, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction. It's starting to sound like conviction to me. If you jump down to verse 27, the end result that God desires in conviction he looks upon men, and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. Lo, all these things works God, oftentimes, oftentimes with man. For what purpose? To bring back his soul from the pit to the enlightened with the light of the living. And what I see in these uh, verses here in Job chapter 33 is I see that there's a misery that comes with it. It's frustrating and, and it's irritating. And, and, and also a lot of times people don't perceive, they don't, Paul did not perceive. And I can prove to you that, that he didn't really understand. I think it was pretty clear, though, when Jesus appeared to him in the vision. I find it interesting that Job here says that when a man is being spoken to by God and he doesn't perceive, he doesn't understand, like, what's going on? You know, what? it's the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to you is what's going on. But if you don't understand, there's other ways in which God can get a hold of you. And the way he got a hold of Paul is in the same way that he says right here in verse, verses 27 to 30 that he'll come in a vision if he has to. He'll come in a dream if necessary. But he's going to get the message across. And so Paul, I can say 
with confidence that what he was doing was wrong. However, what he was doing when he was Saul was still out of sincerity. And there's a place in, in one of his epistles where he talks about that. He's like, look, guys, I know that I'm the scum of the earth, but and I was the scum of the earth and that what I was doing was wrong. But I was doing what I really thought was right at the time okay. or else I would not have been doing it. And so God saw something there that he could work with. He was kicking against the pricks of God's conviction. And God was like, well, if he's not going to perceive and understand, I'm going to come to him in a vision. And he was able to tell King Agrippa that day, I was not disobedient to the holy vision. Amen. So conviction is what God does. Conviction is what the Holy Spirit does. Conviction, God wants to become confession. And confession, God wants to become a conversion. It's not to be confused. Conviction is not conversion. We need to understand that confession is not conversion. But without one, you can never have the other. You have to have conviction before you can have a true conversion. <clears throat> conviction is the Holy Spirit condemning. Stay with me, Robert. Conviction is condemning the old man, the old you. Conviction was the pricking of the Holy Spirit coming to condemn Saul so that there could be a Paul. Yes. That's what conviction is. That's the purpose of conviction. And if the conviction of the Holy Spirit doesn't ever condemn the old man, then there can be no conversion or construction of a new man. And that's again what the Holy Spirit does. God, through conviction, works in man to bring man to himself. That's the purpose of God's conviction. Through confession of faith, man comes back. God uses confession when it's done in faith, through confession of faith. We need to understand what conviction is and its purpose, because although most of us, I would venture to say all of us are saved tonight, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is not going to stop just because we become saved. Amen. The Holy Spirit is going to continue to deal with us. He's going to continue to judge things that are going on inside our thoughts. He's going to continue to judge things that are going on in our lives. And so when the Holy Spirit is come, this is, uh, let's go to John chapter 16 verses 8 through 11. He says in John 16, 8 through 11, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit, speaking of the Holy Spirit, when he is come, he will reprove and convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And he says of sin because they believe not on me. And he says of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And so when he referred to sin, He's talking about convicting the whole world of sin because at that given time, they were rejecting Jesus at that given time. And then later when he would go to the cross and then he'd come off and go into heaven, the gospel was going to be preached. They weren't going to just deny Jesus, but they would also deny the cross of Christ, the world. I'm talking about the world righteousness. He convicts the world of righteousness because Jesus Christ in himself, in his person, he is and was the express image of righteousness. Yes. He is our righteousness. Yes. Because you're saved, or should I say, let me word it a different way. Because of his righteousness, you're saved. Yes. And because he's the express image of righteousness, we're able to leave an old man behind and come in a new man. Romans, Colossians, 2 Corinthians, and Hebrews all talk about Jesus. There's like four or five verses of scripture that I know of that says Jesus is the express image. He's the express image. When you look at the Trinity, every person in the Trinity has a role to play. Jesus was what you would see in the flesh. This is what righteousness is. But Jesus had to go. And when Jesus left and he went into heaven, he said, I'm going to leave with you another. And the word another there is talking about someone different, but of the same kind. The same God, but a different person, 
of that Godhead. And that's who the Holy Spirit is. And so conviction, a good way to understand conviction, this came straight out of the Greek, uh, to warn, to show your fault, to bring to light, to expose, to bring correction, to chasten. It's kind of like the wounding of the conscience because sometimes our gauge is off. The conscience is like the gauge in our soul. The conscience is really, really closely related to the soul. I mean, if you look it up and study it out in the Greek, it's throwing that word soul in there. But conscience is, that's that gauge of of understanding what's morally right and what's morally wrong. And, And it's quite obvious in Scripture that not everybody's moral compass Uh, conscience is right because there's scriptures that actually talk about um, it talks about uh, the conscience being defiled the conscience needing to be uh, having been corrupted there's different references that talk about the conscience where it was designed and originally made to be proper and right and the morals were probably there in the very beginning but somewhere along the way through the resisting of the Holy Spirit, through sin in our lives, sin reigning, the conscience loses its, its, its ability. It loses its uh, good gauge. And so <coughs> judgment, he talks about conviction, bringing conviction for the sake of judgment. Satan has been condemned. Principalities have been spoiled. That's talking of the judgment that's on the kingdom of darkness. In Colossians 2.15, it tells us that the principalities have been spoiled and that the world has been convicted. And so because Satan has already been defeated, God has done something to help us out. Rather than give us condemnation within us, he's given us conviction within us. Both are forms of judgment. I don't know if you, you really look at it that way, but conviction is a form of judgment within the conscience, within our minds, within our hearts. And that's God's way of letting you know that's wrong. Don't do that. That thought is not right. Don't act on that. What you did, you know, if you've already acted on it, it's like our hearts have already begun to become cold. We're not stone cold. We still have conviction. Okay, but we have become we have started to move in that direction because it wasn't stopped at the thought. We acted on it. And so God wants to deal with that because he loves us, because he wants us to make it. That's just it. he's someone who's pulling for us to make it. That's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, is because he wanted us to make it. That's the whole purpose is so that we would make it. There's ongoing conviction of righteousness. It's an ongoing thing where God, the Holy Spirit, will always point us back to what Christ did, the way he lived his life and the life that he wants to live through us. The command came, Paul said in Romans 7, 9, and the sin revived. And he said, I died. The commandment came, the sin nature revived, and I died. It could also be said like this. I don't know if you've ever looked at it that way. The commandment came, Saul revived, and Paul died. And that's exactly what happened that day. Conviction was there. Commandment will bring conviction with it. But it's not possible. It's not possible to obey those commandments without the help of the Holy Spirit through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, and what He did at the cross. Paul had a knowledge that no one else seemed to have. He was gifted. He was talented in a way that no one else was. He had to be reduced to a crumb. He had to be absolutely reduced to nothing to where God could bring him into the kingdom He had his attention. He was blinded. He was on the ground. God told him to stand up. Jesus told him to stand up. And then he sent a prophet to him. He sent Ananias, a man of God, to him to minister to him. I want to look at condemnation and conviction. The differences. You've got condemnation concludes and says that you're guilty. And it says, go away from me now. The other, conviction, concludes that you're guilty still, but it says, come to me, and I'm going to help you get through this. Condemnation seeks to destroy and sentences to death and says it's over. Conviction 
seeks to correct and create new life, says here's another way. Yeah. Condemnation is merciless and cold. Conviction is merciful because it cares. Yeah. Condemnation seeks to criticize all that bad behavior. Conviction seeks to clear of all charges. Condemnation is the one that holds you captive and says, you're the culprit. But conviction holds you accountable, but says you're forgiven. Yes. Conviction is not condemnation. And it's really important for us as believers not to confuse the two. God is the God of getting up. That has everything to do with conviction. He's not the God of giving up. That has everything to do with condemnation. Amen. Satan wants you to give up on faith in Christ crucified because Satan knows as well as probably all of you know that that's the only way we're ever going to overcome condemnation. That's the only way we're ever going to find true, true and real victory in our life. He wants you to give up on that. However he can do it, it doesn't really matter. He'll do it through testing. Or if he can put you to sleep, he'll do it through your sleeping. There's many scriptures, most I find in the Old Testament, where the word awake is used. I didn't pull any of them out to put in this message. But I'm just trying to make a point. Isaiah chapter 30, <coughs> verse 9. I, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 9. And we'll read through verse 11. All right, it says that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not to us right things, speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, because the Holy One of Israel caused the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Now that's an Old Testament passage uh, talking about those who would accumulate to themselves, that would heap up to themselves, as in 2 Timothy 4.3 says, that they will not endure sound doctrine. They'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. I like the way the Young's Literal Translation says it. Instead of saying prophesy not to us right things, it says do not prophesy to us straightforward things. Don't give us the straight cut truth because that brings conviction. That's right. That makes me irritated. That makes me frustrated. That'll make me put my hands in my lap, in my head, and the hands, my head, <laughs> head in my hands, and want to pull my hair out because the conviction is so uncomfortable, especially when you're kicking against it, especially when you're fighting against it. Look, this is not to discourage you. This is to encourage you. This is to let you know that that conviction, if you listen to it, and if you answer it, and if you're obedient to it, you're not being obedient to something. You're being obedient to someone. It is, or should I say, let me back up. He is the Holy Spirit. And He was sent, not by Jesus, but by the Father. The Bible says that the Father was going to send His Spirit. The same way the Father sent His Son. He sent His Son so that He could be the sacrifice and then go back up as the High Priest. And now He presents us to God the Father. And now God the Father has sent the Holy Spirit to present the Father to us. Amen. With conviction. Amen. Amen. But the good news is, from conviction to comfort. That's the end result. That's where it's headed, and that's where it's supposed to go. So we talked about, that was in 2 Timothy 4, 3, by the way, that they would not endure sound doctrine, heaping to themselves teachers having itching ears. Any idea who would be behind all that for them to say that they didn't want to hear smooth things? They didn't want the seers to see visions. Seer was just another word for a prophet type person who had the gift of seeing visions. God would appear to them with visions and show them <clears throat> magnificent, powerful things that maybe were not able to be perceived or, or found in the word at that given time. And so they didn't want to hear those, uh, those hard things. They didn't want to hear the truth because people like Samuel, prophets, you know, Nathan, 
people that were going to bring the truth, it was always coming with conviction. It was usually when a prophet would come out and speak, there was correction coming with it. And it was all surrounding a commandment of some sort that they were not supposed to break. But they were always constantly, seemingly breaking those commandments. So why would anyone not want to hear right things? Because it doesn't always feel good. Preaching is a good thing, but it doesn't always feel good. Conviction often comes in discomfort, but if heeded, ends in comfort. Conviction comes in on the wings of God's truth. Truth carries conviction. Conviction seeks to give comfort. Conviction seeks we just got to see the end result and we got to see the purpose that the Holy Spirit has. Take it back even further. The purpose that the Father has in sending his Holy Spirit to convict us is he wants to bring comfort. He wants to bring us to peace. He wants us to have peace to where we can rest and we can know that we are forgiven and we are free from the sin nature. Amen. We're free from its domination in our yes. life. You know, there's a story of something that happened. It was almost two years ago. It was probably more like 20 months ago. Um, me and Chari, we were on our trip in the Philippines, and we had brought a couple with us, Randy and Kelly Dwyer, on some good friends of ours that live in Centerville. And so uh, we wanted to go take a tour of the Buddhist temple, the Chinese Buddhist temple over there. And so I was like, well, you know, don't judge me, y'all, okay? I brought some, uh, some good witnessing cards to hand out that I always like to make. And I was like, I'm going to make the most out of this trip. So I was putting them everywhere. I was putting them in bushes. I was putting them on seats and chairs and benches. And I started to go put one on an altar. And I don't know if it was Chari. One of them stopped me from doing it. I was like, you know, that probably wouldn't have been a good idea. That's a good way to get thrown out. But um, in the process, we, we had met two young ladies. And I was just... Uh, able to really get a lot of words in and talk to them about the gospel. And we exchanged uh, Facebook with them. And uh, so after I had come back, you know, I just kept sending messages, just trying to witness and share the gospel and get them to, to, to understand, you know, the desperation of the need for Christ. And this one day, one night, this uh, one of them was having a really bad day over there, nighttime where I'm at, you know, it's daytime where they're at. And so um, I just started to really give her more of the gospel, trying to break it down, trying to explain it. Long story short, she came to a place where she wanted to make a decision for Christ. I was excited. I mean, I was beside myself, as, as anyone would be, right? I, I mean, uh, Robert, you probably know uh, just about as well as anybody. And uh, so we prayed the prayer, led her through the prayer of salvation, what I thought was salvation, and it wasn't long after when I started to give her some instruction about leaving the Buddhist temple and leaving Buddha. And I did explain a lot of that beforehand. So give me a break. I did go through a lot of that stuff, but I had to reiterate and I had to really make sure that it went home, you know, because I mean, God, if you're using me to plant this seed, if this is truly a conversion uh, and not just an emotional touch, she was crying. I mean, like she was really moved but when I started to talk about that she got really quiet and she didn't want to talk anymore and I still have not heard from her since and it's been over a year now so I had to question myself and it really you know Lord was she even convicted and I doubt that she was honestly I doubt that she was the very conviction that people will kick away in order to have a short-lived false sense of comfort is the very tool that God uses to give an eternal lasting comfort. If people will just give in to conviction and allow the conviction, welcome it and allow it in and look for the next conviction after you get through one, knowing that the Lord is dealing with you. Be listening to his dealings. Be listening when the Holy Spirit is speaking, because that is one of the prominent ways that the Holy Spirit will speak to us is through that little small voice through the tugging at the heart, through the pricking at the heart. And the pricking gets more powerful the more we resist. Conviction is not smooth, like those smooth words in Isaiah 30. It cuts the heart. It calls out to the flesh and tells it to die. 
and it calls out something new to arise. Yes. Conscience often becomes confused. Therefore, it must be wounded, as we were talking about earlier. And the Bible talks about an evil conscience, a weak conscience, conscience becoming seared like with, as with a hot iron, a defiled conscience, a conscience that needed to be purged. So although God has given it to us, it's not always right. We're not always able to determine what's morally right and wrong. So thank God he's given us the Holy Spirit, yes, that the Holy Spirit would convict us that the Holy Spirit would guide and direct us. The uh, word help, uh, I'm trying to remember what word it was, but describing the Holy Spirit, uh, he's the one that, although he lives inside of us, his help is like someone who's alongside of us. He's always there to help us because he's inside of us, okay? I'm not saying that he's not inside of us, but that's how you describe the way that he helps us because he's always there. He's alongside of us, meaning he's not forcing us. He's not pressuring us in such a way that he's moving me against my will, okay? Was that a good impersonation yeah. of a robot that was fighting? Okay, so... The convictor sometimes will invade and wound the conscience. Why? Because somebody just had to say something. Somebody had to say something that convicted me. If it's heated, the comforter will strengthen the soul. The convictor is the comforter. Conviction calls to correction always. Conviction reminds that sin is not safe. It is not safe, right? Conviction should begin as an evil do excuse me. Conviction should begin as an evil thought enters the mind. A right relationship with God would have it that way. If I'm right with look, I, I'm basing this off of me because I've been there whoa, way too many times, is that when I feel that conviction in the thought, then I know God, okay, at the moment I'm I'm in a good place. If I ignore this and I act on that thought that I know is not of God. It's going to bring me to a bad place. And the conviction next time may not come so early. It may not come so soon, if you know what I'm saying. Because the more we resist, the more we sin, the harder it becomes to hear his voice. But the fact of the matter is he never lets go. He never lets go. His conviction will always be there. The Holy Spirit is there. Faith in what Christ has done at the cross. Faith in what Christ has done at the cross. You know it can't be overstated. It helps to keep that conviction fresh. It helps to keep that conviction there. But a lot of it has to do with the sincerity or lack thereof in our hearts. There's a story about Eli and his sons in the Old Testament. I don't know how familiar you are with the story. Uh, it's in 1 Samuel chapters 1 through 4. It's... I'm going to have to go through this really quickly. But there's a lot of truth there in the, the, that story. Uh, I'm preaching a one point message tonight. This is the first time ever. And the one point is when I begin, I will also make an end. Let me rephrase that. When God begins, he will also make an end. When he starts, that's all in reference to judgment. When he begins to judge, he will bring it to completion. He will bring it to its end. The end can be condemnation, but the end can just simply be conviction to a conversion. God will always, no matter what it is. Conviction is just a smaller, more compacted form of judgment on the inside of a human being. That's what conviction is. Whereas condemnation is more blown wide open for everyone to know about, for everyone to see. When judgment begins, sometimes it's not immediate. But God never forgets and he always brings it to its completion when he says he's going to do something. So there was a priest named Eli and he had sons and two of his sons, Hophni and Phinehas. In 1 Samuel 2.12, it talks about what they were doing as priests. Their duty was to make sure that the offerings and the sacrifices, as you already know, Matt has done a very good job over the years teaching 
uh, all the ordinances and all the uh, articles that are in the, the tabernacle and what they had to do for the sacrifice to be made and, and all those different aspects. There were many different offerings that had to be made. But there was one thing that was not permissible and that was not allowable. There was something that was extremely sensitive. God wanted the fat from those animals, from those, the flesh of those beasts. He wanted the fat and the blood to be for himself. And that was to be set aside for him. No one else was to mess with that. The fat was considered valuable. It was considered precious. It was considered something that they weren't even ever supposed to eat fat. So they weren't supposed to know what it would taste like, especially in the sacrifice, how much more. And so these priests, Hophni and Phinehas, were taking the fat. When the person would come and bring their animal and, and give it to them uh, to do their duty, they would take uh, these three prong, prong, this three-pronged hook and take the fat portion. And if they were not willing to give it to them, they would force them to give it to them. They threatened them and said, I'm going to force you to give it to me because they wanted it for themselves. And so they had grown accustomed to having that. And what they were doing was they weren't stealing just from the people because that was affecting the sacrifice for their sins. They were affecting God. They were stealing from them and stealing from God what belonged to God. And God was not going to have it. You already know that. And so the fire of God would come out and, and consume the fat and the blood. And it would release a fragrance and it would be a sweet savor to God. It was a sweet smell to him. It was very pleasant to God. It was very savory to him. And he said in Leviticus 7, 25 through 27, it was commanded to the priests. No soul eats the fat or the blood. If they do, they are to be cut off. If that wasn't enough with uh, Hophni and Phinehas, they were having fornication with the women. There were women that were actually set aside for the purpose of religious duties in the tabernacle at the door of the tabernacle. And they were sleeping with those women. And so uh, Matt agreed, and then I had, read, I had read it with another Bible scholar, that there was a strong possibility that that might have something to do with Canaanite uh, occultic. Uh, sacrifices that they may have adopted from them because that was common practice um, to, to do what they were doing with the women. And so uh, there's that possibility, but they were corrupting the sacrifices. And we know this church knows how important the sacrifice is and what God described, or should I say how it was described is that their sin was very great. And the question might be asked, why? Men and women who would bring their offerings and their sacrifices, they hated to even do that anymore. The very thing that was to cover their sin, the very thing that would set them free, the very thing that would help them to live a good and a holy life before God, they hated to even bring those sacrifices. It got to a point to where they had no faith. They had no conviction about the sacrifice. And it was because of what these priests had done and how they had profaned what belonged to God. They had profaned from the door of the tabernacle all the way into the holiest, the holy of holies. They had profaned the whole place. And it makes you wonder why God didn't just take them out on the spot when it first started. If you know the story of Aaron's sons and what they did with the strange fire and how passionate God was about the sacrifice and how they offered up some foreign strange fire that wasn't the original fire from the coals from the brazen altar. Whatever the case, God has his reasons for doing what he does and how he does it. But Eli hears about all this and he goes to his sons and you know what he does? He scolds them. He just scolds them. And uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 22 through 25 is where he scolds them. And then later on in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 27 through 36, says that a man of God is sent to come and bring a word to him. And the word of the Lord that this man brings to Eli, he says, how dare you, basically I'm paraphrasing, how dare you kick at my sacrifices? 
to kick away at him. God was so angry in 1 Samuel 2.29. Why was he so angry? Was it just because they were taking the fat? They were taking the blood that belonged to God? It was part of it. Was it just because they were sleeping with those women at the door of the tabernacle, profaning in just a different way, the tabernacle of God? Was it because the people no longer had sin covered because their sacrifices weren't legit? They didn't even want to have sacrifices anymore after all that. Was it because they were stealing that beautiful, sweet, pleasant aroma that God looked forward to, that God took such pleasure in? I believe that's all part of it. I'm not going to say that it's not. But I also believe that Satan wanted to hinder not just Israel, but he also wanted to hinder New Testament believers and distort the symbol and the typology of a perfect sacrifice because Peter and Paul and the rest of the apostles were going to have to teach a whole Jewish nation to convert, to get them to a place where they could be converted to understand what the perfect sacrifice was when Jesus came. And that was a symbol and a shadow and a type of what Christ had already come to do in Peter and Paul's day. And so now it was posing a threat to it. It was posing a, a, a shady picture. And so that's, of course, what Satan wanted to accomplish and then take some more souls to hell with him in the process. But the fact of the matter is, when Jesus died on the cross, he redeemed the whole situation. We know that nothing was lost. And so God tells, the man of God tells Eli, he says, you have honored your sons over God. What he did, taking the fat and the blood, or should I say the fat, which was not theirs, taking it away from God and them being allowed to have it because Eli would not bring the stern, strong correction that was due to them. He said that Eli had honored them over him. So he told him that there was going to be judgment that would come on the two sons and in one day they were going to die. And then if that wasn't enough, he was going to cut off the arm of Eli's house. And he was going to go even further back and cut off the arm of his father's house and remove them from the priesthood. And so getting back to that point that I had made earlier, my one point, when God begins, he will also make an end. He will bring it to completion. Is that this did not happen right away. It happened like two to three generations later was when his house and his father's house was literally cut off from the priesthood. They continued to go on and serve. There, were other, there was other brothers that were able to serve in the priesthood. And so Samuel, the young boy, the beauty of this, Hannah, Samuel's mom, had raised uh, a young boy and dedicated this boy Samuel to the Lord from birth. Now, actually, before birth, when she was pregnant, she had dedicated and, and decided she was going to lend the, her child to the Lord for his duty and she was just basically handing him over to Eli to use for the Lord's service and so in the process as Samuel's getting older and he's growing and he's trying to learn some things Eli's teaching him he had not yet learned the voice of the Lord yet and so you probably know the story about how the Lord speaks to Samuel and he thinks it's Eli while they're sleeping. He gets up, he goes to Eli. He does it like I think three times and then finally Eli gets the light bulb moment and he realizes, man, that's the Lord, you know. So you tell him, you know, when he comes to appear to you, your servant hears, speak. And so it happens just like that. And so then what the Lord says is a judgment and it's a severe one. And I don't know how many people really focus on the word that God actually told Samuel. Uh, a lot of the story that's focused on is just how Samuel learned how to hear the voice of the Lord. But the word is God confirms the judgment that the man of God that had just gone to Eli, he confirms that judgment. And he says it will happen. And he, he said that because Eli knew about his son's sins and restrained not, and restrained not. That was the exact word that was used in the King James. He restrained not. There was no true correction that was given. He scolded them. But just because you scold. Look, if you get on to your child or you get on to an employee about something and you scold them. But there's no teeth in that bite. That scolding. 
that, and they know that there's no tooth or teeth in it, it's not going to do anything. There has to be something to back it up. And the fact of the matter is, Eli knew the law, that they were to be cut off. He didn't even try. He didn't even try to just get him out of the priesthood, get him away from the situation, try to restore him, try to make things right. It wasn't what he did. It was what he didn't do. Right. And the question that I have in that story is where was his conviction? Because the man of God had to come to him to speak to him. He's the high priest. He's the one who's supposed to hear the voice of the Lord. He's supposed to be the one who gets the message from God and brings it to the people. But he had no longer been able to hear from the Lord. And if that wasn't enough, God evidently saw that it wasn't enough. So he spoke again another <laughs> reinforcement of that word through Samuel, through a little boy that Eli himself was training to hear the voice of God because he couldn't hear it anymore. Because he would not hear it anymore. Not because of what he was doing, but because of what he was not doing. See, and I just wanted to use that story. It's a really long story. I was trying to run through it, but I wanted to use that just to point out that you can be a person of God, a man or a woman of God, and you can lose that sense of the conviction of the Holy yeah, Spirit. Sure. You can completely, I mean, it just went silent for him. I don't know if it's because the Holy Spirit wasn't speaking anymore to him. It was like, or if he just wasn't able to hear him while he was speaking, however you want to look at that. But that's a terrible place to be. And so he scolded them without any real correction. He scolded them and there was no sting in it. Eli lost his stuff. He lost his stuff. He lost his conviction. He lost his ump from God. He lost the voice of God speaking to him inside. He's teaching Samuel how to hear God because he evidently knew how to hear from God. He was past tense. He was the man of God, but not anymore. God already had begun to raise up Samuel because Samuel was going to be someone who would listen to God, someone who would listen to the convictions and the pricks, the prickings of the Holy Spirit. It is the Lord. That was his response. After all this happened, Eli, you know, in the morning when uh, Samuel and Eli were awake, he calls for Samuel. Samuel comes to him in 1 Samuel 3, 8, uh, well, chapter 3. He asks him and he, and he pretty much threatens the poor little kid and says, if you don't tell me everything that you were told is going to happen to you. And so he just throws it on him and uh, Samuel tells him everything. And so Eli, he answers and he just simply says, it's the Lord. That was a word from the Lord. He knew it. He knew without a question. And so although the conviction of the Holy Spirit seemed to have left him, he still had within him the ability to repent. He had the ability to turn. And so I'm not trying to be too hard on Eli, but we do need to grab some of the good lessons that we can get from it. Eli recognized God's correction from someone else because he wasn't even able to hear the conviction of his own heart, but he did repent. And so what ended up happening is that the Philistines attacked them. Out of nowhere, they just come and they attack Israel. And 4,000 people died in the first attack. Israel wasn't ready for battle. Their sacrifices weren't even right. Had they brought the Ark of the Covenant out there to have the glory and the presence of God with them, it wouldn't have mattered. The glory would have been there in the Ark. That's where the presence was, right? Between the cherubim on the mercy seat. But it wouldn't have mattered. It wouldn't have helped them out if they had brought it. So if that wasn't enough, then they get themselves all worked up and they said, wait a minute, we didn't bring the Ark of the Covenant out to this battle. We, we didn't have the Ark with us. It's in Shiloh. Let's go get it. Come on. And so they went to Shiloh and guess who was sitting there casually hanging out with the Ark of the Covenant? Hophni and Phinehas. Just chilling. Just hanging out. And so they, they decide, look, we got to have the Ark of the Covenant. We're going to go and we're going to retaliate. We're going to make things right. There he came and they just wiped out 4,000 of us. And so I imagine once they got through the grief of the last battle, they get themselves all worked up. They're, I, mean, I mean, they are shouting. They're screaming, hollering, yelling, rejoicing, praising God. They've got the Ark of the Covenant in the midst of them. They're about to take it with them and go back out to battle. What do you really think is going to happen in this story? The Bible says that the Ark of the Covenant went with them. 
If 4,000 wasn't enough, how about 30,000? 30, 30,000 died. Look, that's sevenfold and then 2,000 and change. That's God telling them something. That's a big message. That's a real big message. The Ark of the Covenant was not for them. They were for the God that dwelled in that Ark of the Covenant, His presence that dwelled in the Ark of the Covenant. It wasn't, they had made it to where it was just some kind of relic. But the whole thing is, the sacrifices were not what they were supposed to be. Conviction was not what it was supposed to be in the, lives of that, in the life of that nation. And so Eli, Israel, they all assumed that if they would just send the ark out with them to battle, that everything would work out. Send the presence of the Lord, send the glory of God, send that ark with them. And everything would just work out. But that's not how God works. He doesn't work according to our calculations. Hophni and Phinehas had corrupted the sacrifices. They were stealing from the Lord. Eli trembled. So there was a man that came back from the battle to tell Eli what had happened. And the Bible says that he heard the noise of the battle. He heard that there was some serious commotion going out there while 30,000 of, of his own people are getting slayed. And he was really concerned. The Bible says that he was concerned for the ark. He wasn't concerned about Phinehas and Hophni. He was concerned about that which represented the presence and the glory of God. He trembled for the ark, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 4.13. Not for his sons. And then when this man who escaped the battle came back to tell him what happened and told him how many had died, he told him first, your sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they were killed. Didn't, he was still trembling, but nothing really different happened until he was told that the Ark of the Covenant had been stolen. And when he was told that, the Bible says that in the seat that he was sitting, he fell backwards. He broke his neck and he died. He was more affected by the fact that they stole the Ark of the Covenant than the fact that his two sons had died. It tells me that he knew the word of the Lord. Yeah. He knew his boys were going to die. There was no question. Maybe not necessarily then, but he knew they were going to die. And so when he heard that, that wasn't a big surprise. So I see somewhat of a restoration there. I see a restoration in, in him, in his heart, in his life. Look, the judgment still stood. He was going to die. He was going to be removed. He was 98 years old, y'all. He lived a full life. All right? So I just... Uh, after that happened in 1 Samuel 4, 21, the Bible says that his daughter-in-law had a child. She was pregnant. And so she goes ahead and gives birth to the child. And what was the name of the child? Anybody know? Ichabod. Ichabod. The glory has departed. That's what it means. The glory of God has departed. Eli could have done something about his sons while they were committing the most heinous sins a priest could ever commit. But he was doing nothing about it. And the glory of God had long departed, had long departed before that Ark of the Covenant had gone. I'm talking about it had departed from them, from them personally. The, the glory of God was not on their side when they took it to the battle. If you would stand with me, we're at the close of this. Christ crucified. When we keep our faith in what Christ has done at the cross, when we keep our faith in what Christ has done at the cross, there can certainly be struggles. There can still be a sin nature that's, that's harassing us, that's coming against us, that's giving us a struggle. It can still be there. But just because the sin nature is still there, just because sin is still there, it does not necessarily mean that God's not there, that His presence is not there.